In this interview, Femi Odulushi talks about one, how his achievements are not accidental. Two, what is coaching? It's a sentence that he's using, but actually the whole conversation is about coaching or many aspects of coaching. And three, he finishes off with a practical tip on how to invite people on LinkedIn and a tip that I hope much more people would take to the heart. I've worked with Femi for, for Meta Coaching, a workshop format where we let its aspiring coaches experiment with coaching in a, in a controlled environment. So I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Welcome, Femi. Um, so, um, what do you want people to know about you? First of all, good day, good, e good evening, good, yes, morning, good evening, and good day wherever people are um, across the globe, because that's what we do these days. We are all over the world. So in the past, we'd say good, good evening, but now it's like, we're everywhere. So, hello. We everyone. don't know where people are and what time frame, time zone they are in. Exactly. Absolutely. But we welcome everyone. So, here I am. My name is Femi Odalusi. And what do I want to know? What do I want people to know about me? Well, first and foremost, um, I'd like to know that um, I'd like people to know that I'm a coach. Um, I like to say that I'm an Agile coach, but I, I go beyond Agile coaching. Um, I'm a Scrum mm -hmm. Alliance certified Agile coach, certified team coach, but I'm also a coach with the International Coaching Federation, ICF. Um, I have done the training program, and I'm just waiting to take my coach knowledge assessment, which would enable me to earn the credential of being an associate certified coach of the ICF. So that's coming up in the next few months, I think. Woohoo! Yes, indeed. Um, Congratulations! Because I, so I knew you were we were busy with it, but I, I had no idea you were already at this stage. So congratulations! Uh, yeah, it has been going on for quite a long time, but that's just the way it is. Um, coaching is mm -hmm. not something that we rush and complete in a month or two. It takes years, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things I like people to know about me. That my journey for coaching has been a long journey. But at mm -hmm. the same time, there's no end in sight. There's no rush. Um, what else do I want people to know about me? Um, well, currently I live in the United Kingdom. I live in Essex. I live with my family, uh, my wife and my two children, uh, teenage children. Um, I work in London. And um, without giving too much away about who I work for, I work for one of the largest technology companies how to say across the world as these things are today. Um, I, I also want people to know about me that in view of what's been going on in the last two years or thereabout, I have a great deal of empathy and I um, stand in the gap with everyone who has been touched by the pandemic. Um, there have been all sorts of impacts to individuals and their families. And I stand in strength with everyone who's been impacted one way or another. I think I'll keep it at that for now. That's already a strong yes. message. That's already a strong message. So it's a, a great way to start this conversation. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing all of that. Well, let's dive immediately into that first question. Um, what is something people usually don't know about you, but has influenced you in, in who you are? Hmm. What, has, what has influenced me um, in who I am? I think the one that stands out for me the most that a lot of people don't know about is the impact and the influence that family life has had on me. Now, I happened to grow up outside of the United Kingdom. I was born in the UK when I, I lived here until I was about four years old. And my mm -hmm. parents returned to the country of Nigeria when I was four. 
Um, I don't remember that far back. I'm going to be honest with you because it was a very long time ago and I was very young. But I do have pockets of recollection of some cultural challenges that I faced as a young child. And one of the things that helped me adjust to that cultural shift was the influence of my, my parents, but more especially my mother. The, the influence she had in making sure that uh, we were well embraced and well adjusted into the um, society at the time. I got to know a lot of uncles and a lot of aunties. And trust me, in Nigeria, people have uncles and aunties. Almost everybody's your uncle and auntie. What stood mm -hmm. out for me the most is how influential some of my uncles were in uh, my formative years and how they embraced not just me but also my brothers and my sister how they ensured that we had a good grounding educationally but beyond education there was also the cultural aspect the societal aspect the integration in society one fun fact about me i studied sociology in university Mm -hmm. Way back in the, I'd started in the late 70s and I finished university in the early 80s. I studied sociology and I didn't really understand what sociology was about. But thankfully, I had an uncle who was a professor who, who made me really, really understand the impact and, the, and what sociology means to society. And when I look back now, I would honestly say that I'm just beginning to understand what social organization means. And that's how much far I've come. Um, the, other, the other fact about the influence I've had um, and you know how it's guided me, um, I grew up in a goal-oriented society. I grew up in a society where achieving goals was, was the norm. And from a very, very young age, I learned how to set goals. And I learned how to take steps to achieve the goals. Obviously, there are times when things didn't work out, but I had guidance from friends, family, and those who'd been on that similar journey before me. They were able to guide me in how to adjust when there was a slight deviation. And I stand where I am today, thanking them for the influence they had on me. So, um, yeah, so when I hear the full story of like, okay, being born in the UK, going back to Nigeria there, uh, it's, um, it's, 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 it sounds like a huge impact mm -hmm. indeed, uh, family. And like you say, if you have lots of uncles and aunties that, uh, they definitely can also have an impact if it's a large family, I, mm -hmm. um, I recognize that, uh, my, my father is also, it has a lot of brothers and sisters and, uh, yeah a large family can have a large impact mm. i recognize that so i want to go to that next question that if you had not been in, into it because agile coaching for me still is somewhere in into it what would have become of you would you have any id because it, it's a hard question for some people here mm. indeed um if i hadn't been it what would have become of me now Here's where I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey. And this is a real life journey. Um, it, mm -hmm. It's a true story. My career did not start in the world of IT. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I share this openly. And believe it or not, my professional life started in the world of accountancy. Wow. Okay. That's I'm, completely I'm, different. <laughs> it is indeed. I'm a chartered accountant. Uh, to be precise, I qualified as a chartered accountant in 1992. Um, I qualified with the Association of Certified Chartered Accountants, ACCA. And I worked in the world of accountancy for quite a number of years. I became a fellow of that association in 1997. Um, here's the fact. Accountancy is rigid. Mm -hmm. well, many people see it like rigid, right? 
Yeah, well, at least in those days. Maybe maybe things are changing now. In those days, it used to be quite rigid. I've done it all. I've done financial accounting. I've done management accounting. I've done taxation accounting. I've done internal audit. I think the greatest achievement in my career was in the world of taxation accounting. Um, what else have I done? Uh, I've, I've done everything you call, can think about from, you know, compliance type of work, regulatory work. But there was something about it. You know, um, in financial accounting, what I discovered was I had to follow standards. If you've ever compiled a set of accounts before, you get a template of a profit and loss account, financial reports. You've got to follow the set patent. There's no room for deviation. If you deviate, you could get into serious trouble. You could be in breach of standards. And I enjoyed doing that. Now, when I did taxation accounting, I had to learn tax management acts in and out. Did I enjoy it? Honestly, it was, let me say, it was not the most interesting part of what I um, mm -hmm. could do because it didn't allow me a degree of creativity. Creativity in accountant is not really something we would... Uh... Creative accounting is actually illegal. People have been... Yeah, that's what I was government. thinking. It, it is illegal to to massage the books and all that. So I know the, I know the rules, I know the landscape, and we have to comply. There, there's an ethical framework. Now, I'm going to bring about some, some correlation shortly mm -hmm. as to how coaching and accountancy how they correlate, what do they have in common. Um, but what I found in those days was, <laughs> now this is a true story and please don't laugh. I remember on one occasion, I was doing audit, trying to investigate and I got so bored and I was just not enough. It was that boring. I was just oh. not enough asleep. Because I was just tearing out the same sheets. This was the days before full computerization. So we talked oh, about Oh, so it was papers. actually on paper. Wow. Papers, yeah, piles and piles and piles of paper, wow. page after page after page. I was just dozing off. So mm -hmm. in 1997, um, I had an opportunity to work for General Electric Information Services. They used to call it GIS, G E I S. And they were building a financial desktop application. And it was internal application. And the, the, the whole purpose of the application was to enable consolidation of data across the whole of General Electric information services and, and the businesses. It was a wow moment for me because they needed people who come from an accountancy background, from a, a background of finance, who would help developers oh, wow, build the yes. application and, okay. and when they build the application to do what the application is meant to do. Now, here's the thing. They needed people who had a financial background and it was just an opportunity that I did not want to miss out on. So I joined General Electric back then and I worked on this EDI application it was an MS-DOS-based application with a front end that was written in, in some fancy GUI. Um, I didn't know a great deal about IT, I'll, I'll be honest, but I had one colleague, Australian guy, Lyndon Sampson, and the guy got me a book, DOS for Dummies. I don't know whether you've seen that book before, MS-DOS for Dummies. I and, I learned, and I learned MS-DOS for dummies front to back, back to front. And I got to begin to understand a bit about technology. I was not a developer. I was just working with developers. But my job was to actually do the financial analysis and translate requirements into, into what they used to develop. Now, I did that for a number of years. And then from there, I moved to GE Capital. When I moved to GE Capital, they took that same application they worked with a company based in the United States, in um, Chicago, in the United States, and they built um, a 32-bit application. Um, and that was when they moved from 16, uh, from 8-bit um, um, DB2 type database to 
um, a SQL database. And, and from there, I started to understand a little bit more about technology. And by the time I moved to GE Capital, I became a business analyst. So I moved from financial analyst to business analyst. And from there onwards, I think I must have been at GE for about four years. From there onwards, I moved from one um, financial services organization to another as a business analyst. My job was basically to identify business requirements and then work with solution developers in the, you know, creating designs and then, you know, um, building solutions. I also dabbled a little bit into the world of testing, make sure that we build applications properly. Because you knew the worlds where it had to be used, so you were uh, a great tester in that sense. Absolutely. Fast forward a little bit, I moved on for, from there, I moved on into project management, and that's where um, the real fun lied. Um, I spent quite a number of years project managing. I worked for um, a number of large financial institutions in the United Kingdom, Royal Bank of Scotland, Lloyds Banking Group, um, First Data International, um, 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 who else? Quite, quite, you know, Barclays, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, the list goes on and on. And here's the thing. Every organization I worked for, I learned something new and new and new and new. And um, the longest I worked was when I was at Lloyds Bank um, as a project manager, managing implementation since I must have worked in close to about 30 projects there over a 10 year period. Wow. And that was fun. And, um, and then it was during that period that digital transformation became a thing and the world of agile started to um, raise its head. And I seized the opportunity to move into that space and became an agile practitioner. And here I am years down the line, I'm still an agile practitioner, moving to the world beyond agile. So um, that's a long wow. story. <laughs> that's a long story, but so, such a fascinating story because it's, well, in most cases, people talk about something next to IT, but this is how you move from, or actually from before IT into IT and gradually moving to coaching and now mm -hmm. to maybe even outside IT coaching. So that's, that's a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you so, for listening. So, so you briefly already touched on, on what you said, what is your biggest achievement. So I'm not sure if that's the, the same one you want to talk about now, but so what is that? And and is it a good, uh, why is it a good thing for you? Well, I'm thinking about this next question. What is my biggest challenge and why is it a good thing for me? Um, my biggest challenge has been, you know, the story I just shared. Mm hmm when we played back later and we listened to it, it sounds as if there was a natural evolution that everything just happened that way, smoothly. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't smooth. It was full of challenges. Mm -hmm, I can imagine. The challenges lie in the fact that I was constantly in a space of unknown. I was constantly right. in a space of planting my two feet on the ground, accelerating my assimilation of knowledge and getting to grips with things fast. The organizational space is one that you don't always have time on your hands to learn. So the, the, the straight up answer to what is my biggest challenge is time. My biggest challenge mm -hmm. has always been setting a goal and then taking steps to achieve the goal. Time is what you need to achieve goals. And time passes. We blink and time moves on. If we do if not- If want it or not, <laughs> time moves on. Time moves on. If we do not proactively take steps to achieve the goals, to work towards the goal. When I talk about my transition from accountancy to financial analysis, business analysis, to project management, to agility. It wasn't as if someone sat to, with me and said, right, Femi, um, this is the next best thing for you. We're talking about a period of time where coaching was not really that much of a thing, where mm -hmm. mentoring was not that much of a thing. 
um, uh, well, at least as it is now, we're talking about a period where you have to be a fact finder. You have to be a self-starter. You've got to be that person who goes knocking on doors, asking questions. Um, those who know me, they know that I never stop asking questions in a good way. I'm always inquisitive. I'm always trying to see how to pivot. What has that done for me in a good way? When I look back at where I am today as a Scrum Alliance certified Agile coach, certified team coach, CTC, a bit of a fun fact about that. I I am the seventh black agilist to attain CTC, Scrum Alliance CTC. There are other moments, there are now eight and counting. No, I became number seven. I happen to be the first um, male person of Nigerian origin, the first to achieve Scrum Alliance certified team coaching. And that surprised me because I know that the Scrum Alliance has been active in, in at least in South Africa for a while. Uh, so I'm really surprised that it's only seven to, to eight Indeed. people that have, uh, wow. Indeed. And, and some of the things that, in actual fact, we got a road show coming up in um, two weeks' time. We had one road show in um, um, September of last year, thereabouts. Um, we now have a mandate to actually raise the profile. What is it that is stopping certain people from moving into coaching, Mm -hmm. whether it's agility coaching or other types of coaching? Um, So so biggest challenge, aside from time, the biggest challenge for me has been finding that way. Finding that way. We never wait for opportunities to come for, to us. I've you always go been that go getter. For, yes. I, I, I'm happy to have been surrounded with a community. When I look back at meta coaching that we did a while back, that was an mm-hmm. initiative that I just saw coming from you. And what mm-hmm. did I do? I grasped them with both hands. Yes, I was about that to was... say that the goal getter I recognize. I recognize the moment that you introduced yourself and that you jumped into it. It was like, wow, okay, this is a person that I can trust that is really want to get forward. That's that's how I recognize yeah. you. This is for me also the reason why I invited you because yeah. these conversations that we had there made it clear for me. And yeah. so I'm I'm not surprised what hmm. you say that you you see these kind of things. I wasn't surprised about the whole journey because mm. I had no idea how, how long that journey was mm. um, with, with all these different steps. Mm. But I'm not surprised in how you acted on that journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I mean, you used good. one word there that struck a chord with me. You used the word trust. Mm. Um, trust is something that you recognize when you see it. And I think maybe we probably had one or two collaborations prior to that and you just and i remember our dear sister as well kemiraji with whom we mm-hmm. both collaborated we didn't even have that much of a, an introduction between ourselves we just mm-hmm. we just engaged and we recognized the level of trust and our collaboration just took off straight away and it's you know i've not looked back ever since then um, to answer the question the biggest challenge and is it a good thing for me? So time and space. And to answer the question specifically, from my perspective, absolutely a good thing for me. And I will not stop recognizing when challenges confront me and then how I identify steps that I can take to overcome those challenges and turn them into opportunities for myself. It's it's well it's such an example. I mean, this is this is a great. This is why I'm even more happy that you're here because this is the kind of thing that I'm. I'm why I'm doing this kind of interview. So so thank, thank you. you for sharing you. And it 
almost automatically brings me to that next question that uh, what drives you because it's clear after what you just said is that you're you're a very driven person because you're you're that goal getter but you know what drives you hmm. what drives me now um i could address this in a multitude of ways um but what i would say in in summary at a very high level is that i'm highly driven complacency is good but mm -hmm. it doesn't have much space in my vocabulary i i haven't in all my adult life placed much emphasis on being complacent otherwise i wouldn't have experienced the pivot that i've had over the years mm -hmm. transitioning professionally from one to another um, profession in an advanced in an advancing way. Um, now, when I was when I was studying sociology many many years ago, I came across something called the NAC thesis. NAC thesis was a concept that we use in socialization. Let me be open and honest and say, I did not really understand the practical implication and how the NAC thesis comes to life until about five, maybe less than 10 years ago. The NAC thesis is actually coined out of the need for achievement. Now, when people hear that someone is driven by the need for achievement, NAC, they might think that it's a compulsive behavior that you're constantly trying to achieve. On the contrary, ENAC is based on the concept that it's a desire for significant accomplishments. And not just significant accomplishments, but the mastering of skills, the mastering of controls, and the mastering of high standards. Now, this is the point that I now want to draw a correlation between my world and in the accountancy profession and the world of coaching. Accountancy fundamentally, now here I've done that thing, I've just done it. Accountancy is based on fundamental accountancy principles. There are four, and I'm not going to go into the four concepts or fundamental accounting concepts now because of time. But in the days when I was studying account, when I was being trained as an accountant, we had statements of standard accounting practice. Um, I remember there were 22. They now call them financial reporting standards. But they also had generally accepted uh, accountancy practices, um, gaps. They also had what you call statements of recommended practices, SOPs, and a host of others across the world. Now, what is the relevance and significance of all that in the world of coaching? Oh, I am a member of the International Coaching Federation. They have statements of values to start mm -hmm. with. Secondly, they have statements of ethics. And thirdly, they have standards. I think there are 28 coaching standards. And you can see the relationship now. Ethics, values, standards. And we pledge to those standards to uphold them and apply them in practice. Mm -hmm. If you contravene those standards, you could actually find yourself before um, a code review panel, CRP, or a, super a supervisory body. So we're talking about regulation here. So for me, the need to achieve is something that I, I thrive best in an environment where there are standards that must that you be know in place. know what to, to yes, achieve. What to do and not to do. In recent weeks, I did a presentation on the 29th of January called Bringing Professional Values, Ethics, and Competencies to Agile Coaching. If there was one thing that we need to strive for in agile coaching, it is bringing standards. 
I think the whole world knows this. Agile coaching is a loose term. That yeah. anybody, anybody can be an agile coach and practice in any way they see fit without conforming to certain standards. So when I talk about the ENAC thesis and the need for achievement, it's the mastering of skills. It's having controls in place, ethics, and it's about having high standards. I love every other coaching federation or coaching body, whether it's Scrum Alliance, Association for Coaching, whether it's EMCC, um, and a host of others. But the one that I hold dearest to my heart is ICF simply because of the standards and the credibility that is in place across the world. And they set themselves up as a gold, as a, as a benchmark that every other um, um, organization aims for. In actual fact, when you look at the, the, the definition of agile coaching, guess what? They use the ICF definition of coaching as the starting point for defining agile coaching. Yeah, that's so, that's what I see. That uh, well, um, amongst others, Lisa Atkins made sure that exactly. uh, it was was used, and and I also see that um, the Agile Alliance is working on ethics. Absolutely. I think you're you're involved in that as well. I, yes, I I'm, I'm involved in that as one of the volunteers. Uh, and um, anyway, watch this space because our Code of Ethics version two is in draft at the moment. Mm -hmm. And what what the proposal is? I mean, thanks to Shane Hasty and a few others. Uh, I've, I've just interviewed Shane last oh, week, right. and we, we talked about it. So we, okay. we bring up the, the whole ethics Fantastic. in the interview. So uh, we'll share it in the interview. The, the ultimate goal is that we require anyone who practices an agile coach to at mm -hmm. least pledge conformance with the code of ethics so that we know that when we show up as agile coaches, we are we are regulated by some set of standards. Exactly. It's not it's not prescriptive, but at least it governs behavior. It governs. Um, it, it builds that word you used earlier on trust. It builds trust between coach and client relationships, and that's absolutely important. Thank so, you, thank you for sharing. That's um, yeah. That explains a lot where where that drive is coming from. <laughs> uh in with and and it at, at the same time it explains a lot also about that journey that you described earlier mm. and the link between these things because mm. i can imagine for for uh, for me the the um, the the journey looks very logical but the way you did it but at the same time it's it's because of practice that it looks logical but this mm. is also on an emotional side why is, it, it yes. makes sense for, for you so mm. thank you for sharing that so, um, and I almost screwed up in the, that previous question or a few questions before, like, what is your biggest achievement? What is the thing that you consider your, your achievement? Mm. What is my biggest achievement? Now, obviously, having articulated the, how I've been able to pivot from this to that to that, it's very challenging for me to lay my finger on one single thing to say my mm -hmm. biggest achievement. But without a doubt, without a shadow of doubt, when I think about where I am today, being on that elevated status of, of being a coach, being a guide, I would say that has been my biggest achievement to date. 15 years ago, I never ever envisaged I would be where I am as a coach. So that's indeed you you even gone beyond what you could imagine in absolutely. a sense. Absolutely. So when I when I break it down and when I look at what coaching is, you know, coaching involves the belief that individuals have answers to their own problems themselves. They have, they are whole people, they're not broken, they don't need mm -hmm. fixing, they just exactly. need someone. Call them whatever you want to call them. They need someone who's not a subject matter expert, who doesn't have domain expertise that they have, 
but someone who focuses on helping them to unlock their intrinsic potential. When I when I started to come across, I mean, I'd say it's when I became a scrum master that I actually gained proper insight into what coaching involves. And believe mm -hmm. it or not, when I had my scrum master training, I knew straight away I was going into coaching. I knew straight away. Mm. My roadmap, carefully constructed roadmap, goes back to when I was doing my scrum mastery, that I knew that I've got to have a pathway to get me to that point. Um, when, when I share my journey, people go, wow. You mean you did all that? Yes, I did. Because if you know where you're going, your job is not just to get there. You're still already thinking the next step. Navigate that path to mm -hmm. get there. Now, what happens along the way, and, the, and this is going back to the question about what is my biggest achievement. When you take steps, for the journey to get you to a destination. It's not just taking steps that matters, but with every step that you take, I pause reflectively to be self-aware of what's going on while I'm taking those steps. What am I learning about myself? What do I know now that I didn't know before? Do I still want to carry on that journey or should I just abandon and just stay where I am? That's do a I... very, very important question to, to recognize also at some point, is there something to abandon? Because some Absolutely. people yeah. keep going even long yeah. beyond the point that they're yeah. interested in because yeah. somehow they, they created something. So thank you. That's I might really have created point. a dream for myself that, you know what, I don't actually need to get there. I might just mm -hmm. need two thirds of the way. I might just have that sudden realization that is the point that the goal is actually fulfilled. So mm -hmm. that perseverance. Now, and I say this, um, having attained the Scrum Alliance Certified Team Coaching and me being nearly there with my Scrum, uh, with my International Coach Federation, ACC, I could just say that where right, that's it. But I realized gaps through self-awareness and self-reflection. And shortly after I attained my CTC, I started my journey for certified enterprise coaching with Scrum Alliance. Because I realized that coaching teams is different from coaching leadership in the organization and the enterprise and leading the enterprise towards coaching um, enterprise agility, totally different. I then realized that I've got knowledge gaps there. And what do I need to do? Continue the journey. So this coaching phase that I have embarked on is one that is continuously evolving. What exactly is coaching? It's not one single thing. It's so many things to so many different organizations and individuals at different times. I doubt whether I'd get to that point where I would say, yes, I'm now there as a coach. Now, if we look at ICF as an example, we've got three levels, Associate Certified Coach, ACC, Professional Certified Coach, PCC, Master Certified Coach, MCC. Now, I've said this to my supervisor before. I'd like to get to MCC. Already now. That's the you... goal. But it takes time, practice, effort. That's the desire. All I can do is keep aiming to get there. And at the same time, there are other opportunities that I still need to get into along the way. But the ultimate goal is not attaining MCC. 
How do I measure my success as a coach? When I look back, when I consider the impact of myself as a coach, when I look at the lives that are being transformed, when I, when I assess the transformations that are taking place for individuals, more especially individuals, when I see the potentials that people have unlocked by themselves, I've only been there to ask them a few questions. I haven't done anything. I just helped well, them. Well, asking the right questions can, can unlock a lot of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I like the way you phrase it because indeed the, the certifications are, are not, like you say, you're, they're, they're a goal in the sense that they help you guiding in a direction, but they're not a goal as mm. such. They're more a tool for helping the people that, uh, yeah, that ask for your coaching. Indeed. And, Indeed. and that trust you uh, to help them. Yeah. I mean, it's, just one last point on that. I know, I know. You know, we you know we don't have all the time in the world. I mean, I know you know me for a fact that I can spend a whole day talking, but you know, we don't have all that time. Um, no. Things don't happen. You know, my achievement, it's not accidental. Um, I mentioned something earlier on about self-reflection. Know thyself. What I found out about myself is that. This is a true alignment of my inner person, me, and what I do, my personal values and qualities. And when I combine all of this with the environment in which I find myself, the reputable profession that, that I thrive in, I, uh, I consider myself to be excelling as a coach because of my true inner self. I bring my true self to the table. Mm -hmm. and, and I that, think that's that is really important as a coach. Huh? It is. That is um, the, the integrity that I think is also when we talked earlier about trust, there is that part of that integrity that is there that that helps create the trust. Um, you you well, in, in what you do, what you say, there is that integrity that Indeed. that people feel, well, I'll, I can only speak for myself, but that mm. I feel when we have that conversation that, yeah, you do what you say. We, I see that in, in all the interactions that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, I hear it in your story. Wow. Yeah, thank it's, you. Um, it's, um, it's wonderful. I, it's taking, indeed, uh, maybe a little bit longer, but I hope <laughs> that for the people who are watching this, that they, they like it as much as I am. Mm. Uh, it's not, there has not been a dull moment in this conversation yeah. <laughs> for me. So, <laughs> so that's, um, that's indeed nice if it takes the time that, well, that's for me is also part of why I think I know I'm, I'm not following all the rules from YouTube. It should be shorter, but for me, it's a, <laughs> if the, if the, if what you're telling is interesting, I hope mm. that the people want to join, but Thank let's you. go to that next question. Like, uh, do you have a personal agility tip to share? Is there anything that you do personally uh, that is interesting for people to know? You shared already a few of these things. I have, maybe yes. there's something else. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the point that we now have to start thinking to condense time and keep things simple, keep it short. So, simple answer, yes, I do. And I've actually just given that answer in that short statement that I made. In today's world, We've seen so much in the Agile space. My tip is this, Agile is simple. My tip is keep things simple. Take complexity out of agility and just make it simple. Just keep it's it. not easy, but it's that's that's the the thing to do. I thank you. This is yeah, it's something that it, it's it, it's a tip that's dear to my heart because indeed we somehow live in a world where people they think well if I make things complexer I look smarter Absolutely. if I yes. if I add everything then yeah it's it's better no no let's let's yeah. go back to the core let's let's see yeah. what how can we make it simpler Absolutely I mean I, I I've I've found myself in an environment that you've just described where there's a huge layer of complexity built around something whatever that something is and 
I come in as a coach and we have conversations and they ask, coach, what's going on there? And my response is basically, oh, that's simple. And people look at me and think, are you out of your mind? We've got this massive problem. And you say, that's simple. And guess what? By the time we have two or three questions and we have dialogue, now they understand why I say simple. Mm. You've got this huge giant in front of you and you approach it with the mindset that it's simple. Guess what happens? It becomes much it more becomes simple. simple. Just because you said it's simple, you just approach it differently, simplistically. And, and looking in the yeah from 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 that angle, I think that that with that you bring also another tip kind of in is that the mindset makes a lot of absolutely what we, what we achieve if we if we are completely and and this is also why it's important to be integer and to be to know what what is in your core because if you're if I have a bad day I might not be in that mindset to be able to go for for that simplicity and, and absolutely. To look for that. So that uh, thank you for sharing that. Not and a that brings us, and we already talked a little bit about for about it. Okay, we we're now. You said it in your introduction, in, living in a almost completely remote world. Mm -hmm. It gives opportunities because that way we can talk. Yes. Um, is there anything else that you learned in this remote work that you learned recently or or before that you want to share with everyone? Yeah, I mean, again, I'll go for a simple answer here. Um, one of the first few things that evolved when this change came upon us, and by the way, it was a change that was enforced upon us. Prior to that, organizations, in to a large extent, were skeptical about hmm, people working from home. No, 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 we don't trust them to work from home. Mm -hmm. They might not be doing what we pay them to do. We don't trust them. That word we used earlier, we don't trust them. But guess what? When that change happened and people had no choice but to work from home, we came back to this mindset shift that we just talked about. Automatically, the mindset shifted that we trust the people to work from home. First thing we've learned is how adaptable we are as people to changing circumstances, how resilient we are, how we respond to external changing circumstances that come upon us, especially when we were, when we were not fully prepared for it. And guess what? Here we are, 2022. And it mostly back. worked. And it mostly worked. worked. Mostly. Yeah. It's and in, in, in just a couple of days, people had to go work from the office to, yeah. Uh, I remember a discussion with the manager, I think on Tuesday, saying, no, we're never going to let people work from home and blah, blah, blah. And on Thursday, the Belgian government decided everybody has to work from home from tomorrow on. Yes. And that same manager came on Friday. OK, this is how we're going to organize. And was like, OK, you know, now you see what we've been trying to say to you on Tuesday. And yeah, it's. The, the world was was changed and and yes. he changed as well like you say yeah. in yeah. an instant yeah. it's, uh, I, I do i do have to acknowledge one thing though it's not been a hundred percent easy there are oh, no. there are some some aspects that we encourage people especially from a coaching perspective what comes most important for me as a coach is self-care mm -hmm well-being the ability to be whole is very important it comes back to this aspect of trust if people are unable to be them full selves on any given day they should do what needs to be done to relax and be their full selves if they have to go for a walk if they have to go for a lie down for an hour to be fully themselves. The pressure of working from home or working remotely is high. The need to want to be seen to be delivering is high and it could take its toll on people. So 
we have to trust one another to get the work done. If, if it means not working when everybody else is working, we have to be fully trustworthy to get things done. That's probably the one advice that I often give. Yeah, it's, it's something I recognize. And in, in uh, my Tips from the Agile Trenches book, that it's one of the, the tips that um, Anke Maertz is, is giving is, okay, love is key because you have to, basically for her, it was, first of all, uh, love herself, expect that, okay, I need to, to give myself the room. And all of a sudden, then a lot more was possible because she realized that, yeah, she, she was not giving herself sometimes the room that needed to be. And like you say, once you give yourself the room to lie down or to do whatever that's needed to be done, all of a sudden there is a lot more energy that comes available for for the work that that needs to be done. Absolutely, and that's um, that's that's a wonderful uh, tip that you give there because indeed with that remote work, it's a totally different world, and it we is, need yeah. we need to think in a different way and and yeah, organize ourselves around around that. Indeed. Um, so that's um, that is indeed a very um, wonderful way to, to think to share that. Thank you. Indeed, my pleasure. I come to that. Uh, well, I say last book, but uh, typically I should probably change the name to "What's a book that you have read that you want to uh, tell people about?" Mm. Fantastic question. Um, so I talked about enterprise coaching recently, um, just not too long ago, and the book I've been Lean, I laid my hand on this book recently. It's called Enterprise Coaching, sorry, Enterprise Agile Coaching, Sustaining Organizational Change Through Invitational Agile Coaching. And this is a book that was written by my coach, Sheree Silas, and mm -hmm. co-written with Michael Dilamaza and Alex Kujinov. Um, these are well-respected coaches in the not only agile community but in the coaching world generally um this book full disclosure i'm not promoting the book i'm just talking about it because it has been influential in my life mm -hmm. it's full of words of wisdom it's full of real life practical experience and it also also provides some guidance to coaching the one that stands out for me the most in that book is invitational coaching. Now, I've never been a directional coach and neither have I been a coach that is instructional. I'm, a, I'm an invitational coach. I My coaching style is in service of the client, non-directive, mm -hmm. working in partnership, working towards achieving outcomes for the client, whether the client is an individual or the clients in the organization, or for that matter, it might be leaders within the organization. I walk the journey with them. I partner with them in achieving the goals. And when I mentioned earlier on about my success is dependent on how lives are transformed, um, feedback I get from coaching clients or mentors, mentees, are, uh, wow, I never thought I could do this quite easily. You've made this so simple. What seemed impossible is now just so simple. And it just keeps me going. And I learned quite a lot from that book. Okay, thank you. It looks like, uh, and it's, yeah, it, well, you kind of mentioned it earlier on in your transition. Well, you didn't mention the book, but, but what you were doing there. So I'm, I'm not surprised you bring it on. I, I haven't read it myself, okay. to be honest. It's, uh, it's, um, I'm glad that sometimes a book comes up that I haven't read myself. I heard about it. So you just bumped it up again a little bit higher on, uh, on my stack of to read books. <laughs> um, but that, I'm glad about that because it's, it's indeed yeah, the kind of book for, for agile coaches and, and like you say, for, for coaches who want to go that next step. Absolutely, um, yes. That, uh, that I think is a, is a, is a good one to, to have for people who are interested in that. That brings me to, uh, for me, the most interesting question. Well, with all your answers, that's maybe a hard thing to say, but still, um, what's the question that you think I, I should also ask and, and what's the answer there? Oh, 
interesting question that so what what question do you think you should ask and what's my answer well having thought about this long and hard it is a tough question but i know i, I will say um an observation that and I, and I touched on this earlier on um in today's world the differences and the different interpretation that exists in the world of agility, what agility is, what it's not. And um, we need to find ways of harmonizing our thoughts and see how best we can streamline all the different approaches to agile such that everyone is right and no one is wrong, if that makes sense. Hmm. Everyone is right, no one is wrong. There's so many different flavors of agile, and, and that's okay. But what we witness sometimes is that's not agile. Oh, my flavor is. is agile. Yours is not agile. It's okay. Everyone is agile. Let's just work together. Let's work in service of clients. Let's work in service of customers. Let's have a transformation focus. Let's find ways of delivering better mm. value. Keep the customer at the focus of what we're trying to do. Let's even, even if we have to change the word of um, the, the, the word from agile to something else so that we stop the infighting. Yeah. It, it... It, it it's when I when I encountered the agile world, let's put it like that, in the in the early two thousands, it for me it was like a very collaborative world where we worked a lot together. And the last years it seems to be a lot of fighting between this is more agile than that's more agile. And and it's tempting to go into that because I was asked today also about something and, and yeah, for me it was like, okay. I want to explain what I like more about this without yeah. saying this is completely bad. No, there are some good things in it. Yes. I learned this and that from yeah. that. But I'm preferring for this particular client in this yes. circumstance, I prefer this because I think this makes more sense. Absolutely. But that's something else than, than saying this is completely bad and this yes. is the only way. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, um, there is no only one best way, you know. And this is where having seasoned coaches to guide the process helps. Guiding the process within the organization. Every time, every organization is different. You're not, you're not gonna have two organizations within the same sector with exactly the same DNA. So what works in company A doesn't necessarily have to work in company B. It's okay. Let's find a way of making things work. Yeah, and, and I would even say in the same organization it can be that different exactly, teams work differently. Exactly. And this goes back to the word simple that we used earlier on. Just keep it simple. Just yeah, keep it simple. I like that. Keep it simple. And that's, let's not complexify. Because indeed, if we want to have the whole organization work in the exact same agile way and the only true agile way for this company, it becomes much more complex because Absolutely. we need a lot more processes and a lot more other things around. Absolutely. That's that's actually a very deep way and, and things to, to think about things. So thank you very much. Thank you. And it brings me to that, uh, that last question that um, who do you think I should ask next? Well, next <laughs> is probably in one of the next episodes, not sure. just the next one. But. Do you know what? I actually have two people in mind, and I'll ask you whether you've been around to them yet, because chances are you may well have. Um, I mentioned her name earlier on, Kemi Raji. Mm -hmm. Has she been yet? She's not been yet, but she's on my list. But I also was looking for an excuse to invite her, so now I have it. <laughs> the, the other so name that... I had, which I'm pretty sure that you've got as well, is Anu Gopal. Um, Yes, she's. Uh, I, I'm not sure. It could be that I've invited her already. I'm not okay. sure. I need. I need to check. But these are two wonderful names to indeed. Two wonderful to, to names. Help. Two two mm. wonderful names who are, um, who are co, Scrum Alliance coaches, who are co, um, ICF, um, trained coaches, and who are um, renowned in the industry for their tenacity and their focus. I mean, I could go on with a longer name list of names. Um, I've mentioned Cherie Silas um, already, so you know that name has been mentioned. But I've, I've also got Kwasi Uso, um, yeah in the list, but 
you asked for one name, so I'd leave it as as one of the two that I mentioned. Yeah, that's uh, well, the two, and maybe you're you like you said, um, the the person who wrote the book, who's your personal coach. That, that's actually a name that was not on my list that okay. I can uh, add okay. her as well, uh, because it's um, it's it should have been on my she should have been on my list. Yeah. But yeah. The list can go on for, but that's well for now. I don't know when I will stop with these interviews. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic so... job, by the way. You, this is an awesome, absolutely fantastic piece of creative work that you're doing, and I thank you so much from the depths of my heart for for creating that platform on scripted for us to come and share with thank you, you and the it's, world. Um... It's uh, well. I, I think it's. it's I, I'm, I'm. I was a bit um, negative on myself lately because I thought I could have done this at the beginning of the pandemic because mm. this is the perfect time to start doing this. Mm. Um, but for me, it still feels the same thing. Like I don't. I'm not yet in the space where I think I can go out to the world and talk mm. and and go to conferences. Mm. So how do I reach out to my mm. friends uh, around the world? And for mm. me, that feels uh, the right way to do it. And why not record it and then share it with the rest Absolutely. of the world? I think, Absolutely. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's again about sharing the knowledge, sharing the, the people that we know, because that's, yeah, that's for me how the Agile world Absolutely. works. Absolutely. Mostly works, and that's what I wanted to do. Indeed. So um, we're about uh, recording more or less an hour. So I wanted to know what is a good way for people to get in touch with you if they want to, to talk and find more about you. Mm, thank you so much for that question. Um, one of the easiest and, again, simplest ways is um, I'm available on LinkedIn. All you need to do is search for Femi Odelusi. Thankfully, I'm the only one by that name. So um, there's no chance that you could get the wrong person. But even if you're not sure, I'm pretty sure that my pictures are my profile. Um, you can identify me. I'm very responsive on LinkedIn. However, um, I do have daily commitment. So um, I may not get back to people within 24 hours. But what I do is I always respond to people with you know, nice. whatever requests or, or, or requirements that I have. So that is by far the best way to reach me. Thank you. And I, I think that's indeed how I reached you originally, how we Absolutely. got in touch. And I can I can indeed share right. that you do that. Because it's um well LinkedIn is for me is 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 a good platform at the same time I see sometimes abused a lot. Um so it's the last years sometimes a little bit looking. Um uh, and LinkedIn makes it hard because I always want to put in a little message why I contact people and somehow yes. they they somehow replace some things and it gets mm. harder. I think, oh, I get a, an opportunity to put in a message and oh, mm. it's a, the contact request is already sent depending on which yeah. which screen I'm using. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a good way to contact people that yeah. we haven't met yet. Before. Yeah, I, I would say that I'm pretty sure a lot of people do this already. In the very early days of LinkedIn, and I'm going back many years now, I just used to click on the connect button. You, you see someone you like, you click on connect. More recently, at least in the past five years, I challenge myself when I connect with people, why am I connecting with this person? So I ask myself the question, why am I connecting with them? And in so doing, I click on the personalized invitation. There's a button there. Mm. You personalize it. And you just like you said, you write a note to them about why you want to connect with them. That is by far most important because it establishes a personal connection between you. You also give the other person an opportunity to understand why they should connect with you. There are so many connections out there in LinkedIn that are meaningless connections. Yeah. Anyone who wants to be taken serious should put a message as to why they're connecting with someone. Yeah, and that's that's what I said. I think I think it's in the app that it's it's harder because I, I always think, oh, I can get the option to write in a, a, a message and then it's already sent out. It's like, no. And on the website, it's it's much clearer. And, so and you have to click on the bubble, on the three dots. Exactly. And then, and then go through that list, yes. 
so that's um, yeah, it's it's a little bit different. But I anyway, apologize for people who do that already. So it wasn't meant to be instructional to patronize anyone who knows that. But for those who don't, that's a bit, a bit of a tip. It's an extra tip on top of all our conversation. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, My great me. pleasure. I I wish you a good evening, and I hope to see you back uh, somewhere in the flesh in 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 a later time. Indeed, and I wish you the same as well. Have a fantastic evening, and thank you to everyone who's been patient enough to listen to us. Thank you so much for your time. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Who's Agile? Where the stories of agilists come to life. I hope you liked today's interview. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other agilists.